Hey everyone, I just wanted to tell you that my Patreon is now live, where you can catch new Classic Sin and DLC Sin content. The first episode of Classic Sins covers the original Silent Hill, while the first episode of DLC Sins is on Resident Evil 4 separate ways, all for just $3. Now on to this incredibly long video, the last time we looked at Square Enix's theatrical rendition of how to stretch a tutorial section into a 60 hour game. Part 1. Cloud had just finished a climactic fight with Sephiroth and achieved the narrative equivalent of running in place while claiming you just finished a marathon, but it also ended on the promise of the untold story will continue. Having defeated destiny itself, the plot was now free to forge a new path, unbound by the restraints of its forebear. So imagine my utter lack of surprise when Rebirth stuck as close to the original game story as Remake did, which was so focused around defying destiny that at every turn, plot police had to be called in to guide things back to the predetermined path whenever canon was threatened. The plot ghosts are gone, for the most part, but it doesn't seem like they were as necessary for keeping things on track as was implied, because even though the party is supposedly free to chart a different course, the road less traveled barely has any footprints on it. All Square Enix really sought to accomplish was create a multiverse, a convoluted narrative escape hatch to undo the most well-known death in the series. I'm reminded of all those fake revive Aerith guides. Some people were so drawn in by that zine that they refused to move on or understand the narrative weight of her character's sacrifice, and so looked to the early internet for guides to revive her and earn the good ending they just knew had to be hidden there somewhere. And trolls were more than happy to waste their time by guiding them to 110% the game while completing several other bizarre rituals involving the mechanics and minigames, all stamped with a wink and an ASCII art seal of approval on their GameFAQs guides. It's as if Square Enix decided to canonize these digital folk tales, turning the desperate hope of reviving Aerith into a multi-game quest. This isn't a narrative choice, it's a pilgrimage through space, time, and fan theories, demanding a commitment to traverse three games in countless hours for a narrative payoff that will dilute the impact of the series' most profound loss. Rebirth begins with Zack, having survived Shinra's attack on him outside Midgar, thanks to the creation of a multiverse with the defeat of the Whispers, arriving in the city and discovering that this is the aftermath of Avalanche's assault on the Shinra building in battle with Sephiroth. Presumably, this is the timeline where the party lost, since they're either dead or comatose. From the very start, the whole multiverse is confusing, because for Zack to be arriving now means he also had to have time-traveled several days, and he was placed inside a universe that doesn't reflect his survival, because it effectively has two clowns, the one Zack is carrying, and the one who arrived in Midgar after Zack's death and joined up with Avalanche, who was conveniently missing and nowhere to be found with the rest of the group. Mayor Domino released a statement declaring the tornado to be close weather warfare perpetrated by the infamous insurgent group known as Avalanche. I understand the need for propaganda, but claiming Avalanche can control the weather is a hard pill to swallow. Just because they're an environmentalist group doesn't mean they can send a tornado at you. Zack watches a news report of Aerith being loaded into a helicopter. That's a continuity error already, because I played through the DLC of Final Fantasy VII Remake, and at the end of that there is a scene where Zack is pacing outside of Aerith's church before entering and finding only mournful people inside. I don't know when that scene could have taken place now because Zack just entered Midgar and has already discovered Aerith's location. Zack hands Cloud over to Kyrie and asks her to take care of him while he chases down a helicopter on foot that he saw take off in a news report that was recorded before he even arrived in Midgar, meaning this helicopter took off a while ago and he already missed the window of opportunity. Not that he realistically had one to begin with. What was he even planning to do chasing a helicopter on foot? He does get very lucky though, as Red 13 wakes up inside the chopper and attacks the crew, causing it to crash near him. Zack, who swings around a buster sword, a boat anchor of a weapon, decided it wasn't big enough to do the job and chunks a piece of rebar and cement at the chopper. I don't believe that Zack knows that Red 13 brought down the helicopter, but he sure as heck assumed correctly. As we'll learn, the white materia Aerith possesses is what gave her her knowledge of the future in Remake, and with each encounter with the Whispers, those memories were sapped and the white materia was drained. But this Aerith's white materia is unaffected, even though it should have been exposed to the Whispers and been drained as well. Because the Whispers were present in this universe, since it's simply the bad ending result of the one from Remake. Back in the main timeline, Tifa gives Cloud the go-ahead to give his account of the events of the Nibelheim disaster without ever asking how he could know any of it. These are of course all false memories created by Cloud's Genova-influenced mind. This was always one of the more weaker moments of the original game, since it required Tifa to keep her mouth shut on the subject until the very end, but now the entire party comes across as a group of idiots who are coddling a man's delusions. Those squats are poor form, too much forward momentum, with the arms assisting on the lift instead of using your glutes to push. In hindsight, sending Sephiroth to the reactor where the body of Genova is kept, alongside a mansion full of unsecured and classified intel on Sephiroth's creation, was a poor decision that could have been easily avoided. There's family resemblance, and then there's Rule 63, your main character, and saying the result is their mother. You know, there's all kinds of temptations in the big city. 
I'd feel a lot better if I knew you'd found a good girl. Considering Tifa has been one of gaming's most popular fictional characters in all the fan art and fiction, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there's bigger temptations right next door. You went through my stuff? In the future, Cloud better use the Genova influence excuse to explain that he never went uninvited to Tifa's house and looked through her wardrobe. In a village full of people who know the way up the mountain, their guide is a 16-year-old Tifa who nearly got herself killed the last time she tried taking the path up. Also, this is Shinra's property. Why not send this team up in a helicopter instead of hiring a local guy to take them up the mountain? How did employees routinely get to the reactor? The idea that Sephiroth needs a guy to show him the way up the mountain is laughable when you realize this guy is navigating the multiverse perfectly fine and guiding multiple rogue figures across the planet to him. Gameplay-wise, not much has changed since Remake except for general improvements. Dodging no longer requires materia to perform, but is an ability everyone possesses. The only major addition are synergy attacks that allow two characters to team up. It's an idea taken directly from Chrono Trigger. Much like this whole alternate timeline multiverse is also a messier version of that game's plot. You can likely expect the only major gameplay difference in the third game to be three-person synergy attacks. If Mako gas is so bad that the elevator won't even function until it's cleaned up, Maybe don't create a machine that has to be pushed by hand to vacuum it up. Does no one work at this Mako reactor? It's completely empty and the only way to reach it is by a treacherous mountain pass and rope bridge. Shinra only keeps the body of a dead alien inside this place, and it's not like they don't have a terrorist problem. I think that at least warranted a security detail. Path of least resistance be damned. Lightning decides to strike the wooden bridge instead of the large metal reactor building directly in front of it on top of the mountain. If you can stand in a river you just fell into, that means you likely hit the bottom of the fall and died. I mean, why can't you stand up? Cloud and Sephiroth did it just fine. I noticed this game ignited a discussion on player guidance being heavy-handed by slapping everything with a coat of yellow paint. Where the hell were all of you when I was making jokes about ledge paint back in 2014 in my very first Sin video? Maybe you only noticed because the climbing mechanic in this game sucks so much that you spend more time looking at the painted ledges and other examples. Fixing the reactor is as simple as turning one valve. If this place had been staffed, this issue could have been solved as soon as it occurred. Eventually. We went back to the inn. I have to assume Genova hates Genesis as much as everyone else, because in her editing of Cloud's memories, she cuts out the part where he shows up and taunts Sephiroth inside the reactor, right as the guy is starting to snap after discovering he was created like these monsters. Later on, Sephiroth spends all this time in the Shinra Manor basement. Vincent should be down here in his goon cave, but not once did he bother with Sephiroth or Cloud coming and going from the mansion's basement over the next several days, and that's despite him having a score to settle with Sephiroth. Excavated from a 2,000-year-old rock layer. A life form in stasis. 2,000 years is not enough time for a rock layer to form. You can dig down a few feet and be at 2,000 year old soil. Typically rock layers form after hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, unless we're talking volcanic rock. Genova. Verified as an ancient. Much of Sephiroth's fall to madness comes from an incorrect scientific conclusion by Professor Gast, who assumed Genova was an ancient like Aerith. How did it come to be that there were zero bodies of ancients to study, that the clearly alien Genova could fool them into thinking it was one? The Cetra were a civilization that spanned the world. They had to have left behind remains. Ah, Cloud. I've come across the most fascinating passage. If the information is not found in the middle of the book, it's not worth reading. I should go. Mother is waiting. I should hurry. Mother is waiting. But first, a detour to burn the town to the ground, even though that is in the opposite direction from the reactor. Sephiroth isn't as thorough as he was in the 90s, seeing just how many people survive this time. Cloud is too injured from a fall to walk at a faster pace than ice melting on a cloudy day, then proceeds to get injured further by the blowback from his mother's house fire and is reduced to crawling. You must experience these cinematic moments at the pace the developers set, which is always, always way too damn slow. I guess the village didn't use the water tower for its intended purpose, because that might have actually put out some of the fire. After he killed the other three, refusing to shoot makes this look like a suicide by Sephiroth. I followed Sephiroth all the way back to the reactor. The way you were limping through the village, I'm going to say no you didn't. Tifa's father was against her guiding Sephiroth and Cloud up the mountain due to how dangerous it is, but decided to take his daughter there to hide once the town was set ablaze. You can let go with a sword, you know. You'd think a two meter long katana would have an easy time cutting Tifa in half at such close range, but all Sephiroth managed was a small slash across her abdomen. Mother, together we will reclaim our world, and I know exactly how we can do that. The Promised Land. Shinra has no idea what the Promised Land even is, so how could Sephiroth have learned enough from reading those books in the library to formulate a plan around it for world domination? He wouldn't know what the promised land is either. This planet too, for I have been chosen. 
So begins Sephiroth's turn to villainous ASMR content creator. His ramblings are devoted to Cloud's mocking fetish from here on out, and he can't reach a decibel value above 30 dB. A couple days later, they started reporting that he was killed in action. Yeah, that was it. The news outlets are nothing but Shinra mouthpieces spewing propaganda. Only dumbasses believe that shit. Question. Does that make me a dumbass? In regards to believing that Sephiroth died in combat, yes. Don't you think whoever killed the most famous war hero in the world would have taken credit for it? Eris' knowledge of things she had no right of knowing were erased by the whispers. This was a detail Square Enix decided upon after Remake was released, because they sure as hell weren't taking her memories in that game in any way she seemed to notice. More questionable than that, I kept waiting for them to explain that the whispers took all their materia, learned abilities, and equipment as well, but received no answer. Maybe they accidentally left all that in that farm truck that gave them a ride to calm. This is gonna sound crazy, but as far as I know, Cloud was never in Nibelheim five years ago. It does sound crazy, and should be way more concerning that Cloud would not only know all these things he shouldn't know, but placed himself at the center of it. Falling asleep with a lit cigarette is nothing compared to the danger of allowing Red 13 to sleep on a bed. You know that I killed her. So, who is she? Sephiroth begins messing with Cloud's head to make him doubt that Tifa is real, that he killed her back in Nibelheim and must be a manifestation of Genova, which results in Tifa showing Cloud the scar on her body as proof. The natural follow-up would be to ask for proof that Cloud was there, but it said Tifa quiets her own doubts over this, because that's a big moment they have to save for the third game. Where were you again? In fact, where have you been this whole time? For five years! Since you have no memory of Cloud and Nibelheim five years ago, shouldn't you be asking where he's been for the past eight? Since the last time you actually saw him was on the water tower the night he made a promise to you. You know I can't tell you that. You just told them the most classified information you were ever privy to. But you can't tell Tifa where you've been for the past five years? Welcome to the new B-plot of the game, a season of Yu-Gi-Oh! Red 13 joins the party for real, and I think I used him less than any other character, including Kate Sith. I can never find a good place for his combat style, which is built around blocking and absorbing damage to fill his vengeance meter, which is used for a handful of his abilities. Outside of boss fights, most battles don't go on long enough to fill the meter, which leaves him with half as many abilities as the rest since he needs both ATB charges and vengeance meter to be effective. Also, almost none of the NPCs bat an eye at a talking dog. Cloud's own party was surprised by that in Remake. But here Red 13 will stroll right up to people in this game and speak, and almost no one will say, Holy crap, a talking dog! In hindsight, it should have been pretty obvious Shinra would come to Calm looking for them. It's the only town along their escape path and is the nearest location to Midgar. Fortunately, they stayed at the end of a sympathizer who has a secret escape tunnel, and who finds Cloud and Aerith the minute the assault on Calm begins and sneaks them out of town. He even already found the other members of the party and ushered them into the tunnel under the inn, even though the team were all spread out across town doing their own thing. No longer contained to Midgar, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has gone open world, which makes sense given that every Final Fantasy up to 9 promised a globe-spanning adventure, just one that played out on a simple three-dimensional map until you reach a location. For the most part, I never got too annoyed with the open world, except that for some reason Square Enix decided to double down on Chadley and make him your guide for the entire adventure, constantly tasking you with investigating phenomena he wants to study. Chadley is like an invasive species in every environment he's placed in. I'd almost forgotten what it was like to be young and in love. You'll just head straight that away toward the swamplands. You'll find an abandoned building by the dock. I guarantee no one will bother you there. Bill, a chocobo rancher, gives you directions to an abandoned building in the swamp that's ruled over by a giant snake because he thinks you're looking for a romantic place for a threesome. And a dirty swamp full of man-eating snakes is what came to mind. Is home to the deadly Midgard Swarmer. Beware. But even if you're slow, you can rent a chocobo. I know a scam when I see one. You need a chocobo to get safely across the swamp, but you're broke. But Billy will give you one of the ranch's birds that ran off that morning, probably because they don't keep their pins closed. And if you catch it and bring it back, you can keep it. A person with basic common business sense will instantly see the problem with this arrangement. Since the ranch is losing out on this deal, they don't get their bird back and receive nothing in return for it. He does recommend you buy something from the ranch's store though, so this is seeming more and more like an unethical grift. Do you think maybe he's still hungry? Sorry, that's all the food we had. If all it took to tame a stubborn chocobo was feeding it once, then the problem wasn't with the chocobo, but with the ranch not feeding them. See, the chocobos were a scam. I was promised these birds could outrun the Midgard Stormer. Everything that was optional content in the original game is now mandatory, including this boss fight. 
Sephiroth makes an appearance to save Cloud's life and keep with the continuity by piking the Midgard Zormer. This is the guy who now controls the Whispers, the Guardians of Fate, and he's doing every single thing he's fated to do. Cloud passed out underwater, but when he comes to, he's back on the surface with no answer to how he got there. How did the robe figures get across the swamp without chocobos? This is a sin I could ask at almost every step of the journey, because these barely functioning robe people seem to gain access to every location no matter how seemingly impossible the odds. Those guys are looking for him too. They've gotta be. Let's not lose our... Sephiroth appeared underwater from nowhere and disappeared the same way. No matter what you do, you're never going to catch him unless he wants you to. As soon as we can handle We've dealt with worse. That's easy for you to say. You fought the worst for a living. Not us, though. Yeah, good boy. You mind taking the lead, Merc? The party sure lost their confidence between Midgar and this mine. It's not like they didn't just fight a giant snake or something. Does Tsung normally shoot someone to introduce himself? Take care of Aerith for me. Take care of Aerith for me, which is followed by ordering Alina to toss a grenade at her that causes her to fall off a ledge. Barrett has no trouble swimming or climbing rock walls despite his gun arm. Since the robe men are following Severoth, they hope that following him will lead them directly to him. Though instead of apprehending one of them so they always have a Sephiroth compass, they rely on the random chance of stumbling upon a group of them whenever they have no idea where to go next. Rhonda, the mayor and sheriff of Under Junon, checks them against the Avalanche Wanted poster. This poster implies that Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse are still alive since they have bounties, but Wedge and Jesse are definitely dead. And in Wedge's case, Shinra would even have his body since he was knocked out of the Shinra building hit the pavement right next to it. Gotta be black robes around here somewhere. So how are we gonna find them? You just left a group of them right outside under Junon on the road here. If they mean to continue west, there are only two ways off this continent. By sea or by air. That is the only way off any continent without a land bridge, of which none of the continents of this world possess. Yuffie, whose defining character moment in the original game was being bait on To Catch a Predator Midgar edition, is now a real character. No longer optional, no longer sidelined to an assist role in Vincent's terrible game, and she even had the DLC of Remake all to herself. Hey! Shinra's most wanted! Get rid of that thing! Say what? It's an aquatic monster and all of you are on land. Just leave it alone and attend to Yuffie. Somehow this game manages to feature two attacks that involve a dolphin. The only minigame Final Fantasy saw fit to cut was a CPR minigame to save a young girl's life. This is a game that minigames things that weren't even minigames in the original. There's a picking mushroom minigame that exists for one single side quest. There was no reason to make this nearly as uncomfortable as they played it up to be. Regret what I said in calm. Maybe you should mention that Sephiroth was the one who put the idea in your head in the first place. That seems like a fairly significant oversight in your apology. My name is Yuffie, Materia Hunter and Elite Ninja Operative for the interim Wutai government. I left my beloved homeland behind to bring an end to Shinra's reign of terror and prove that Wutai's not to be trifled with. Hee <laughs> <laughs> hee, I'm a nationalist. Traveling alone so far from home is expensive. So I've been moving from town to town, hustling, scraping together enough scratch to keep sticking it to the man. Until, that is, I came here. And lucky I did, because I met Rhonda. She offered me the gig of a lifetime, an assassination. Rufus freaking Shinra! Shinra and Wutai are in a ceasefire agreement at the moment, so this isn't something you should take on for travel money. You want to know how Rhonda's planning on paying me? With your bounty suckers. By telling them that Rhonda paid for the assassination by informing on them, aren't you ensuring that you won't be paid for this, since bounties only pay out if the culprits are apprehended? Roche would rather fight Cloud again than bring in Aerith, and challenges him to a fight up in Junon without telling him the location of the arena, which is secretly hidden inside a restricted area Cloud would ordinarily never come across. The hell's this supposed to be? <laughs> your bounty. Part of it anyway. They paid you the bounty even though none of them were apprehended, and you kept part of the money to give to them even though they would likely be prisoners after turning them in? Worked out fine. Like I pray it will for Yuffie upstairs. You hired an immature teenager to assassinate the president of Shinra, a girl who was nearly killed trying to get up to Junon the other day because the only way up to the upper level is being launched up to a catwalk by a dolphin. And you just alerted Shinra to the presence of Avalanche in Junon on the day of Rufus's inauguration, where you expect him to be assassinated. How did you ever figure this would be a good use of money? Junon is a military fortress on the coast, the defining characteristic being a gun bigger than the entire city. This gun is meant for firing at Wutai during war. For this gun to hit anything in Wutai, it has to lob a shell all the way across the ocean, across the western continent, and all the way across another ocean before it reaches Wutai. The equivalent would be firing a shell from France and hoping to hit Japan. 
Despite being wanted terrorists who would be incredibly easy to identify due to how much they stick out in a crowd, even without wanted posters, you can walk amongst all the Shinra troopers and not one of them will be suspicious of you. A civilian walking around a military staging area alone should have security on them. An emissary from Wutai is here, sent by Viceroy Saruth. The only way Nomura knows how to make something mysterious is by draping a cloak over it. Some people just don't have the stomach for war. And this battle for the Magnus Materia demands commitment from both Wutai and Shinra. Wutai had an agreement with Rufus's father to start a war where they would fight over the Magnus Materia. Somehow this is supposed to unify the world. I'm not sure why they have to agree to a managed war when they could just have a real war for the Magnus Materia if it's that important. One of them's gonna have to lose and be conquered for the world to be whole, right? Barrett wants to take this opportunity to get a one-on-one -on -one with Rufus to get answers out of him, so they disguise themselves as Shinra troopers in order to get close enough during a parade to ask him what's up. That's actually the plan. Just disguise himself and ask Rufus what he's up to in the middle of a parade full of soldiers, and they seem to believe he's just going to answer them. All other Shinra troopers' helmets cover their eyes with built-in vision goggles except for Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith, who I have to assume are wearing them incorrectly, because they certainly covered Cloud's eyes back in Nibelheim five years ago. Hee <laughs> hee, I'm so silly. I kept my finger on the trigger while pranking you with a loaded gun. Cloud, knowing the drill routine is understandable, but how do Tifa and Aerith pull it off with zero training? Congratulations! You are hereby promoted to parade captain of Midgar's 7th Infantry. So what you're telling me is that you didn't have a parade captain before, Cloud, even though you're competing in a military parade this afternoon. We'll round up your fellow troopers currently on leave in Larvor, Junon. Wouldn't the 7th Infantry have an agreed upon rally point at a specific time, instead of being rounded up in town? Are you three mob heads? Helmets aren't masks. Fire! Everyone in attendance is now deaf and every window in Junon would be blown out. Honestly, it's probably worse than that. Considering this gun can lob a shell halfway around the planet, all the people under would likely be killed by the shockwave. Rufus and the Turks are aware that Avalanche has infiltrated Junon and are taking part in the parade, but take no action and Rufus even tells them to stand down so he can speak with them. At this point, they have no idea why Avalanche is here. Given your history, you might expect something extreme like a bombing or assassination, but they seem to suspect that they're just here to talk. You are a fascinating individual, Cloud Strife. Your file was as gripping as it was enlightening. You read Clown's file? That means all you read about him was being an unimportant Shinra trooper up until the last few days when he reappeared as part of Avalanche. Makes you think why they never used Clown's on-file photos from his time as a Shinra trooper for the wanted posters. Rufus doesn't care much for his father's old plans or apprehending Aerith and the rest of the team, so offers a deal. They stay away from Midgar, and Shinra won't look for them. And in return, they have to kill Sephiroth, a surprisingly fair deal. Though I don't know how Rufus figured out Cloud and crew were after Sephiroth. The potential deal goes south when Yuffie tries to assassinate Rufus, and he wrongfully assumes this was their plot in getting close to him, which makes a lot of sense given that they are Avalanche. This is why you arrest wanted terrorists instead of having a meeting in public with them. Instead of ordering all of the Shinra troopers to arrest or kill them, Rufus just walks away and Junon is thrown into chaos without knowing who to arrest, so Cloud ends up leading the 7th Infantry all the way to the dock, killing other Shinra troopers on the way who just assume everyone they come across must be the assassin, even other uniformed Shinra troopers. We've heard rumors that there are others in league with the terrorists. Conspirators in stolen uniforms. So kill all of your fellow soldiers because of an unconfirmed rumor. Rose somehow knew Cloud would head through all these back rooms and arrive at this secret arena, so he gathered all these Shinra troopers who should probably be out there looking for a potential assassin instead of watching a Bloodsport matchup. Dude even brought a live band. How did Roche avoid losing his legs? They would have been right along the path of Cloud's Buster Sword. That's your cue to exit. Yonder elevator will take you down. Head to your ship. I don't believe anyone in Shinra's military is capable of turning in a wanted person if they're hot enough. Someone just tried to assassinate the president, but this cruise ship is leaving without delay despite the assassin not being apprehended. We know the culprit's a young woman, just lightening the mood. But you said earlier that there might be people in stolen uniforms, and you never met Cloud before today, and he uses a non-standard buster sword. These guys have to be marines to be this stupid. Will we see each other again, sir? Unless you guys end up as the crew with a high wind in the next game, you better pray you don't meet Cloud again. Those guys with you too? <laughs> Where'd they come from? Cloud and the others are getting on because of the uniforms. How do you figure these people wearing robes are with them? Ever see that Faz guy again? No, but there are times when I think I do, and I freeze up. I had to go searching the wiki for who Faz was. Turns out he's a character mentioned in a recent novelization, and responsible for freeing Aerith and her mom from Shinra, but was also apparently a creep. Okay, fine. 
but why bring up this detail without any context or explanation, forcing everyone to look up the details to have any idea what she's talking about? I was kind of hoping we could talk business. Uh, what kind of business? You know, business. Boys. Cloud interrupts before Tifa and Aerith can ruin this game's Bechdel test score. My apologies, sir. But I'm afraid animals are not allowed to participate. What? Dogs are not allowed to compete in the card tournament, but a robot is. Who should I say is competing? Cloud Strife. You could at least use fake names when you're on the run and on board a Shinra cruise ship. I never knew I could just not officially enter an event, challenge the person that wins the finals, and then take the title and prizes for myself if I win. Military personnel are to report to the deck immediately. Military, huh? Guess that's us. Where are the rest of the military personnel? You never see any. It makes the Shinra military look worse now that Avalanche is doing their job for them. I guess Shinra doesn't have a Coast Guard if the captain is contacting Hojo during this emergency. You will have pride of place in my lab. However, do mark your body to aid in identification. <laughs> Ha uh, ha uh, ha. Uh. So I start next week, right? Because getting a tattoo is going to take a few days. Hojo told the captain to allow the experiment to progress uninterrupted. Killing the road men hardly seems like compliance. Yuffie probably should have been helping Barrett well before being in a robe threatened her life. Why don't I get these guns that kill four people with two shots? Sephiroth transforms the dead robe men into a Genova monster. I guess he never considered settling this with a game of Queen's Blood. Cloud. Don't let her fool you. Sephiroth is suddenly convincing Cloud that Tifa isn't real, but an illusion of Genova. So far, Genova hasn't exactly been subtle enough to create Cloud's best friend from his childhood, have her work in Midgar for years with Baird and Avalanche, only to finally run into and recruit Cloud for a mission. What would even be the point? And why would Sephiroth try to warn him of it? Somehow Cloud is being convinced by this. Yuffie experienced zero motion sickness while on board the ship. You better not be suggesting we all hit the beach. You guys are wanted for pretty much everything after the deal with Rufus fell through. Is your plan to hide in plain sight? Because it's not going to work. I already suspect anyone riding a Segway of committing heinous acts against humanity. Johnny might be able to pull more guests to his hotel in Costa del Sol if he removed the loading gate in front of it. Tifa, you'll be staying in room 101. Aerith, you're in 102. As for the dudes... You can all bunk together in 103. Why do your room numbers start at 101? You only have three rooms to begin with. The price? I'd never even think of charging you. Now that I think about it, not a single end of this game charges you money. Oh, fate is so cruel, depriving me of Tifa and beachwear. Have you noticed that all the men Tifa interacts with in-game are just as awkward and creepy as her fans in real life? You can't go to the beach without swimwear, and Cloud resembles a goth who shops exclusively at military surplus stores. So you have to run around town doing minigames to win points to purchase swimwear for yourself, and then again as Aerith and Tifa. Meanwhile, the robe men are just hanging out no problem. The game even realizes this inconsistency, and straight up tells you to ignore it. Are you almost done? Aerith? Red 13 will speak with his real voice when in private with Aerith, then switches to his fake older voice once Aerith goes quiet. Tell me, what color would you say this is? None. Well, at least we know Red 13's not colorblind like most dogs. The Whispers stripped Aerith's white materia of its power, and the Whispers were responsible for keeping Destiny on track. If they were gradually erasing the power of the white materia that whole time, then they would have disrupted Destiny themselves, because Aerith was meant to have the white materia so she could cast Holy to stop Meteor in the original timeline. The Italian Parliament is not going to find this scene amusing. I'm in need of a few female assistants. <laughs> Think about it. You could help give birth to the world's next hero. Midgar needs a Me Too movement. Add it to the running list of movements and regulations needed single-handedly because of Hojo. Hojo came to the beach to relax in the original game. Hojo comes to the beach in Rebirth to get banned from the beach. The gastropod captures the entire party, save only Yuffie, who then comes up with a bizarre plan of making clones of Johnny, who carry fake robe men onto the beach, who then turn into exploding Moogle dolls, something Yuffie will never do again despite how broken it makes her. If she can make clones like this out of anybody, then what's stopping her from making a dozen clones of Cloud and sweeping the floor with any enemy they come across? What happened to all the monsters Hojo captured inside the gastropod along with the party? Once destroyed, only the party members come out of it. We've done enough. 
You were justified in killing this man. He did horrible things to you both and just attacked you again. Letting him live and walk away only ensures he will do it again in the future. No one even got into the water during this beach episode. I follow some rogues. Oh, those dudes shuffled off toward Mount Corel this morning. Why did the robe men stick around to the beach for an entire day doing nothing in the first place? Some know me as the world's greatest materia hunter. Others, and I'm unstoppable assassin. We're using Yuffie's self-introduction animation from Integrate, are we? In a throwback to the original scene, you have to answer questions before Yuffie will join the party. Unlike the original, there is no outcome where she doesn't join up. Yuffie forces her way into the party without even learning what the group's objective is or if it lines up with her own. She just sizes up the materia in the party and then never steals any of it. What are the odds that Turks would choose this spot to drop off a batch of robed men and brought a deadly robot with them that they can call at the press of a button when they probably didn't assume they would need something like that for a mundane mission? Magnus materia, weapons, Wu Tai, these are all points being set up for the third game. It took them two games to get through disc one, and the next game will finish all of this, but they're setting up a huge war that didn't happen in the original game on top of all the other content they'll have to get through. We used Avalanche's activities as a cover to sabotage our own reactors and destroy Sector 7. Your father assured us these acts were in service to the Neo Midgar project. However, the fact remains that we have yet to locate the promised land of legend, or even confirm if it actually exists. That was really stupid of Rufus's father to destroy a good chunk of his city on the promise of building a new city on a location no one knows of, or if it even exists. There's something I've been meaning to ask all of you regarding those decisions. Why is it that none of you even tried to stop him? My father built his empire with your loyal support, and I demand the same. Ruvez is trying to say he wants the board ready to kill just as many people for him as they were for his father, but he sure presents this in such a non-sequitur way that I think he doesn't see the irony that he just identified the problem with the board. Now slow down. I've been to your place. Shinra's got it staked out. Not anymore. They have bigger things to worry about. If I wanted to surveil someone, one of the tricks I would do is pretend to leave. The world's ending. I got to ask what kind of rock he's living under. A giant yellow rift in the sky isn't exactly easy to miss. Which way do you think Midgar is? It would be east of here. That way. You spun in a 360 degree circle, Red, so you're now pointing in the same direction you were before you started moving. Everyone was ready to kick those old farts to the curb. And that's when Colonel Lodbrock's team showed up. Three ex-soldiers ready to join the cause. I was wrong about Yuffie being a nationalist earlier. Turns out she's an extremist. She helped overthrow her own father and imprison him and turned the country over to three black road former soldiers. Why are their giant gears built directly into the rock walls of this mine? They serve no function other than being industrial decoration. Control rooms up there. At the top of the cliff. That is an awfully out of the way location for the bridge controls. With Cloud out of commission due to Genova related headaches, Yuffie and Barrett have an entirely too long adventure making their way through the mine to reach the controls with the help of a grappling hook. This would have been a better location to take control of Barrett since he used to work here, but they wasted him inside a cave shooting rocks. Really pushing the justification for boss fights here, aren't we? Predators preying on other animals is just the natural cycle of life. I thought you guys were environmentalists. Chicks can't fly. That's the whole point. They have to develop flight feathers first. They don't build terminals like they used to. This one was built outside, exposed to the elements, had birds build a nest in it, and it still works. To link back up with the others, you had to choose a minecart path for them. One which would surely kill them, and one that wouldn't. Apparently drive-bys are a cure for motion sickness. Corel is where Barrett grew up, and the people here hate him for advocating to build a Mako reactor nearby which exploded. Afterward, the town was destroyed by Shinra and has nothing to its name except dirt for your face. But it doesn't have to be this way. This town is the gateway to the Gold Saucer, and also conveniently located right next to Costa del Sol, the two largest tourist attractions in this world. There's no reason they shouldn't be able to capitalize on that prime location. Hell, Barrett and Yuffie just went on an impromptu roller coaster ride on their existing infrastructure. At least charge a fee to use a lift here to get to the gold saucer. When I got hurt back in Nibelheim, they brought me to this clinic. The doctor here, Sharon, he's the one who saved my life. Corral is a long way from Nibelheim for emergency care for a stab wound. You're living proof of the good in people. I've seen what people on the internet do with Tifa, so she's also proof against the good in people. The doctor is performing tests on the robe men who come through town and believes they are former soldiers suffering from cellular degradation. He asks Cloud for a blood sample since it would help out, but Cloud refuses. They could have given him a better reason for refusing, such as another of those green static flashbacks to when he was experimented on. Cloud nearly murdered Barrett when he saw Sephiroth in front of him. The party should be applying pressure for him to be tested. Corel 
wasn't much. Decent place with decent coal. Awfully ironic that the two different types of energy production Barrett was involved with both slowly kill the planet. Why would you guys get excited over holograms of a freed and Shiva? You can summon the real deal. At least they're finally on a real wanted list. It's about time. That's all well and good. But why am I in charge of handing out the posters? You two just ran into them back on the mountain. And now you have to escort Palmer to the gold saucer to put up their wanted flyers. Forcibly changing someone's clothes in public without their consent is a form of sexual assault, and Yuffie is a minor. Also, was that a dress fear from Final Fantasy X-2? This scene manages to be simultaneously the most feminine, gayest, and masculine moment in the game. I'll let you decide which parts are which. Kate Sith is one of the more complex characters. He's a Scottish robot cab being controlled by Reeve of the Shinra Board of Directors, and I have no idea how that's supposed to work. Reeve somehow manages to perfectly control a robot on the other side of the world with zero lag while going about his regular duties back at Shinra. And this was a plan set up by Shinra to keep eyes on the party by infiltrating it in the most obtuse way possible. Kate Sith works here as a mascot entertainer under Dio, and seems to have held the position for a while, so this plan was put into action some time ago, long before the party arrived. And Reeve is such a great actor, he can put on a perfect Scottish accent and act completely different from his usual corporate self. Being dropped like that over and over are going to do a number on that poor receptionist's back. It must be really hard to practice proper gun safety when your arm is a gun. Just lifting your arm into the air threatens the lives of everyone near you. Also, why are you allowed to bring guns into a children's theme park? The only location in this world that banned weapons was the beach. You there, dangly man. Would you mind checking one more time? That should have been obvious that Kate Sith just hacked the system and stole the rooms for them. The sweet Kate Sith stole from Palmer doesn't come with a bathroom. Back in the other timeline, we find out Biggs is still alive. Somehow, Shinra knows he's alive as well, even though I don't see how they could, since as far as they would know, he's buried under the rubble of Sector 7. A member of your party will come and ask you on a date, even though it's past midnight. Apparently, the gold saucer is open 24-7. While you're out on the date, Barrett encounters a man with a gun arm and gets suspicious, even though he's packing the same equipment and should be just as concerning to everyone else. I'll round up your pals for you, alright? Now get going, there's not a moment to lose! Cloud doesn't even question why Kate Sith would come search him out like their best friends when Barrett is suspected of murder, or that Kate Sith would know who his pals are that he's going to round up for him. I won't begrudge anyone who has employed a pharmacy to build a body like Dio's, but flexing amidst your dead employees and guests is poor taste. The assailant took care to knock out the cameras, and so we have no image of their face. But according to eyewitness reports, it was a man with a gun grafted to one arm. Even if the assailant shut up the security cameras in this room, you would have security footage of Barrett in a different location when the shooting was taking place. Also, which arm the gun was attached to, right or left, would be known from the eyewitness accounts and would also clear Barrett. Where exactly did you pull that wanted poster from? You only wear a cape and tights. I'd also like to know where you were keeping that tracking bracelet you put on Cloud. Dio gives the fugitives wanted for terrorism and the attempted assassination of the president 24 hours to clear Barrett's name of this crime rather than turn them all over to the authorities. Dio already knows that the killer went to Corral prison beneath the gold saucer, so he already has a solid lead on the murderer and doesn't need to send the suspect's friends to exonerate him. He can launch an actual investigation. None of them question why Kate Sith is so invested he accompanies them on the search. The moment they get off the elevator, Clown and Party are surrounded and easily knocked out by the local gang in charge. This is the same group of people that fought Sephiroth to a standstill on top of a tornado. I'm always a bit surprised when villains fail to disarm their captives, but when the weapon is a sword the same size as the person carrying it, make them haul that crap around. Gus captured the murderer as he left the gold saucer and has him locked up in the desert, and he captured Cloud and his friends because he knew they were here looking for him, and Gus did this because he wants Cloud to be his chocobo jockey in the gold saucer race, even though he has no reason to think Cloud would be a good chocobo racer, other than his twink-like body not weighing that much. If he captured the murderer, why not just offer him up to the gold saucer for a reward instead of going through a convoluted scheme to win a race fairly? There are plenty of other ways to raise the funds out of Cloud. Hmm. Can put a price on anything. This is not quite the high fantasy adventure I was expecting. Raising money so my female and animal friends don't get sex trafficked. I'm starting to understand why that bird ran away from the ranch. The kid never feeds his animals. Before you can race, you need to get your chocobo healthy again by feeding it greens you collect by taking them from random thugs and criminals in Corral Prison, who all seem to carry chocobo food on them. We got old Shooty McShooterson tied up nice and tight in a shack out in the scrapyard. I don't think Cloud ever learned if Baron was even down here. He certainly didn't ask for details on who Gus had locked up in the desert. 
They get caught in the middle of several tornadoes that appeared on a cloudless day. Then Barrett appears and directs him to hide behind him while he blocks the storm with his body. The guy is big, but not that big. I'll be chewing on sand for weeks. Reeve really goes all in and controlling Kate Sith because Reeve will never have to worry about sand or his own personal safety because Kate Sith is really just a fancy remote controlled drone. Barrett has been wandering the desert, accomplishing nothing in his search for Dine. He never even bothered checking the only place here with people, Corel Prison. Dine, Barrett's best friend, and the only person to oppose Shinra establishing a reactor in Corel, is the man who shot up the gold saucer. They both lost their arms when Shinra attacked Corel following the reactor explosion. The troopers were able to land shots in Barrett's leg, but once the two of them were immobile and hanging over the ledge, the troopers failed to hit them and all three of their guns jammed at the same moment, so Scarlet took one of the jam rivals, did nothing to unjam it, and with absolutely terrible gun handling, fired from the hip on them, with zero recoil, since she never lets off the trigger and keeps her aim steady while never running out of bullets as she managed the aim only at Baird and Dine's arms. After Dine fell into the ravine, I guess Scarlet stopped shooting, because Baird got away and rescued Dine's daughter Marlene. So Marlene's. Did Tifa never question who Marlene's biological parents were, or how Barrett came to be her surrogate father? There was no saving my arm, so I made a call. Instead of the normal prosthetic, I chose a means to an end. Gun arms are nice, but I've seen incredibly advanced robotics in this world. There is no reason to attach a gun when a functioning robotic hand would allow you to use a weapon normally. I saw him at the saucer, saw the bodies and the bullet holes, but that's not who Dine is. Whatever his faults, he's not a monster. Looks like someone has already forgotten the lesson of Clowns Nibelheim's story on how an upstanding person can be driven insane by tragedy. And Shinra. Where's Myrna? She ought to be here. I what happened to you? Would be nice if Barrett recognized a similar insanity cloud displays. His isn't as on the nose as Dine's, but there are clear similarities, and Barrett fails to call them out. Dine's gun arm having ammo drums built into its design only emphasizes the lack of any magazine in Barrett's gun arm. Barrett must have chosen the most boring gun arm option, because Dine's gun can use an entire junkyard as a club. Eleanor and Marlene are waiting for me, but I can't bring myself to join them. Marlene? She's alive. Maybe you could have led with that fact. I would have led with that fact. Shinra shows up again and this time managed to land kill shots on Dine, so the game can avoid having him suicide off a cliff like in the original, which was far more depressing and poignant, but this is 2024, where you're not even supposed to say the word suicide. Palmer changed his fate from being hit by a truck to having a soundtrack that hits like one. I've been using this to eavesdrop. Can never be too careful. But you are innocent. And I was wrong. Dio wouldn't have heard any of the conversation between Dine and Barrett because Clown was nowhere near them with a tracking bracelet, so he heard no evidence that would actually exonerate Barrett. You will receive a proper burial, I promise you. This guy killed a bunch of your staff and guests. I'm surprised you'd be so accommodating. Does anyone know how to drive this thing? Leave it to me, lass. What help could Kate Sith possibly provide? Because that robot is not sized to drive. He can't even reach the pedals. And why is a fully grown man insisting he sit his avatar in Tifa's lap? As if I don't know the answer. You sit. I got this. That would have been real helpful of you to handle the Shinra troopers chasing you back in Midgar. How did Rude get back inside the chopper with Alina? Rude was wrestling Dio while Alina chased after the party in the chopper. Alina didn't need to jump out of the chopper after Palmer accidentally shot it. Rude doesn't jump out, and he's just fine, so he clearly regained control of the chopper. It's a good thing that Alina landed on a metal buggy. She might have gotten hurt had she hit the ground. None of them are strapped in, and it's open top. At the very least, Baird and Cloud would be tossed out as well. Tifa has to swerve out of the way to avoid running over Alina, which is some curious mercy since I don't see a reason to spare their enemy here. Reeb is driving the buggy while simultaneously editing the wanted poser so it no longer resembles Cloud, Baird, and Tifa. Why even put out flyers when Shinra already has a man on the inside keeping watch over them? I don't think I would agree to go to war with an enemy that can teleport directly into my office whenever they want. You act all buddy buddy, but we don't know a thing about you. Let's fix that. There's not much to know. I'm a 9 to 5 nobody at a small Shinra subsidiary. Another paper shuffling, copy paste and forward other emails. Lowly Shinra employees don't have the knowledge to operate robot cats to the point of being combat efficient. Kate Sith is supposed to be a theme park mascot character. This is akin to lucking out and getting a SEAL Team 6 member turned Disney princess. We don't have any leads. And driving in circles, hoping to spot a black robe is... The worst idea ever! Relying on a hope and a prayer to spot a robe man is what you've been doing this entire time, and it's been working. 
You mentioned something earlier about the Corel reactor. Did you not? You saw a weapon there, right? Yeah, but I don't recall telling you. Between Cloud's deteriorating mental state and Kate Sith's continuing suspicious behavior, Barrett is showing an odd talent for picking up on serious red flags and then immediately ignoring them. Kate Sith's fortune reading mentions mushrooms, which gives them the idea that they should head to Gungaga because the place is known for mushrooms and there's another destroyed reactor there just like in Coral where they saw a weapon. I'm not sure how a weapon would clue them into where they can find Sephiroth, but they all decide to head there anyway. You. What? Uh, nothing. For a second, I thought you were someone else. Cisne, a former Turk, recognizes Cloud from when Zack brought him through Gongaga after the Nibelheim accident, but clams up and refuses to mention those events or Zack. We're on a wee field trip, you see? <laughs> we Unless Kate Sith is often donning his Scottish robot cat persona and undergoing secret missions, I don't see how Cisne would recognize him. Shinra is very inconsistent with their disaster response. They blow up their own reactor in Midgar so they can blame it on Wutai, but never mobilize against them afterward. A reactor explodes in Karel, and they attack the town claiming anti-Shinra rebels there destroyed it to cover up their own mess. A reactor explodes in Gongaga, and they rebuild the town and build a memorial for the dead. And in Nibelheim, they build an exact replica of the town and turn it into a health retreat. You wouldn't happen to know our son, would you? Zack? I mean, he's carrying around Zack's buster sword on his back. Chances are pretty good he has some connection. So, this Zack guy, you still like him? Maybe. He's never given me a reason not to. Other than not contact you for five years, Aerith should be a lot more concerned with the last known sighting of Zack. I have to assume Tifa told Aerith about Zack being in Nibelheim when Sephiroth destroyed it, but the thought that Zack might have died finding Sephiroth never seems to occur to her. It was also strange that in Remake, Aerith didn't know what had become of Zack, despite her knowledge of all things relating to the plot that she should know. I figured the Whisper's purpose was served back when they were defeated in Remake and the party was no longer bound to destiny. Now they're Sephiroth's lackeys and everyone can see them. The guy already had a bunch of black robe minions serving him. He didn't exactly need more. Since this reactor exploded years ago, how is it supplying power to itself for computers and pumps to work? Scarlet appears in hopes of catching a weapon. I guess you forgot there's an exploded reactor in Midgar a weapon might appear at, or the one in Corel that has a known weapon in it. Well, when did those get here? How did you miss loud gunships flying overhead on a clear day? I can't help but notice the big design oversight of having your mech's cockpit be uncovered. Scarlet came here to capture the weapon with this big crane that I suspect she thought the weapon would just swim right into. That pipe separates the girls from Tifa. Cisne gave all three of them grappling guns to get around the destroyed reactor easily, but those two won't use them here. All of the Shinra troopers stop shooting long enough for Cloud to be brainwashed into fighting like Sephiroth, and then he massacres them. Scarlet orders Shinra to withdraw, for some reason. The Whispers swarm her, but they're not doing anything but annoying her, and Cloud is mowing down her forces, but I doubt she cares about them. She leaves even though she's close to her goal. Cloud's reaction to Tifa is on par with the Italian Senate. Jesse's father suffered Mako poisoning from being near a leaking tank of Mako. Tifa can swim in the stuff and face no ill effects. A weapon then swallows Tifa whole, placing her inside the giant materia in its body and taking her on a tour of the live stream. The question I have is why is it doing this for a random human? Did it know that Tifa was aware who Sephiroth is? Because showing this to a random person would have just left them very confused. I have to assume it had some knowledge of all this, because it brings her back and spits her out once finished. <laughs> Yuffie I understand, but Reeve is a grown adult man, listening in at the door alongside a 16 year old. After learning about the Whispers battling inside the livestream, Barrett decides they should make a pilgrimage to Cosmo Canyon to learn about planetology. Ironically, this is exactly where Sephiroth wants Cloud to go, but he gets him there for free without any meddling or sending black rope figures there. To call the plane, you have to start a fire at the airstrip. Smoke signals are not great for communicating with anything over the horizon. The plane would already have to be in the air nearby to spawn it, and there would be no way of telling if it's just a regular fire or someone wanting to pay for a ride. Sid is the only party member to have been drastically altered. Everyone else is more or less the same, and even encountered in the same place. Sid is no longer a bitter and jaded pilot whose dream of going to space was dashed by Shinra. Now he's a roguish air pilot running a travel business. Sid telling people to sit down and drink their goddamn tea was just too toxic. But the old girl likes a challenge. I prefer my pilots to have a better attitude about airplane safety. Uh, did I miss a scene that would explain Roche's sudden motivation to be experimented on by Hojo? You can fly over the canyon rather than straight through it. I know this looks majestic, but it just makes you look like a crappy pilot who's risking his passengers' lives. Hey, guys! It's me! Come back! Nanaki? Red 13 drops the wise old dog character the moment he's home. 
Since for his species, he's the equivalent of a teenager. That was some impressive acting he kept up in front of everyone except for Aerith ever since they first met back in Hojo's lab, where he had no reason to even put on a show since he didn't know them, or that he would end up teaming up with them. In that regard, he's a lot like Reeve, who adopts a character so radically different from his actual self that it's hard to believe that he could keep it up the whole time. And even though he's revealed that his deep voice is fake, Red 13 will still switch to using it from time to time. Why wear sunglasses when you're already nearly blind from cataracts? Bugenhagen even wears them at night. I'm not a child anymore. I'm 48. 40 what? Tifa really took to the young Red 13 idea quick because he's been pretending to be older and wiser. Older and wiser than 48 at least. Ever since she first met him. That's more than old enough. I can protect our veil and everyone in it. Which is more than I can say for my good for nothing father. That was an abrupt shift into Red 13's daddy issues. You seem awfully sure of yourself, miss. Because we saw them with our own eyes. Two in the Corel and Gungaga reactors. They were loud and huge. <laughs> A fascinating account. Were it true? Red 13 was the one who explained what weapons and whispers were to the rest of them, something I assume he learned from Bugenhagen. But the old man is completely dismissive of Tifa's account. Bugenhagen gives them a lesson on planetology. Life is born, then dies, and finally its spirit, body, and mind return to the life stream. Since this all seems pretty verifiable, it's a wonder Shinra isn't aware they're killing the planet. Unlike, say, oil, where you know it's the remains of ancient life and a non-renewable energy source, Shinra seems to believe Mako is endless and doesn't have any idea what it is or where it comes from. You rang? Very sharp hearing on those two acolytes and make out Bugenhagen's muffled clapping through his sleeves from another room. Please escort this young lady to our seminar room, would you? They'll have Aerith and Tiva selling candles and essential oils in no time. So, I'm an ancient, as in a steward of the planet. The planetologists haven't believed a word they've said so far, but they accept Aerith as a cetera without even a shred of proof. I'm not sure what prompted her to share all this at the River of Light ceremony, but I guess everyone gets to know now. However, you have a trial to undertake. I do? If you wish to prove yourself and become a Watcher of the Veil, that is. Having disbelieved all of their stories about the planet in the livestream, and with Red 13 having only arrived home today and said one word about his father, Bugenhagen decides now is the perfect time to set Red 13 on a dangerous trial in the sealed caverns so he can learn the truth about his father and remain with the party instead of staying in Cosmo Canyon. Who's gonna observe? I'll do it. Oh, that would render the trial meaningless. For some reason, Cloud can't be the observer during the trial, and instead Bugenhagen picks Barrett to accompany Red 13 through the caves. It's not as if Bugenhagen knows anything about either of them, so why discriminate? Such walls should be well within your power to climb. The walls are painted yellow after all, however I don't know what makes these walls so much easier for Red 13 to run up versus every other wall in the game. These are apparently just very special rock walls that appear nowhere else. These look like the statue I picked up. If there is a reason for everything, then one could argue that everything has no reason. How did Red 13 ever learn so much from Bugenhagen when he displays incredibly dumb philosophy like that? Also, it's a puzzle mechanic, so Red 13 is right. It has a very obvious reason, informing you which pedestal to place it on. Resourceful you've become. Yeah, great job opening that gate the only way it can be opened. You should have seen him play cards earlier. Now that was impressive. He still watches over us to this very day. Seto, Red 13's father, sacrificed his life protecting the canyon from the Gi, only to be named a coward and traitor who ran away when the Gi attacked because it was thought that Red 13 might seek out his father here if he knew he had died heroically. It's one of those explanations that doesn't hold up for even a second, but packs enough emotional weight when accompanied by an awesome soundtrack. What kind of unending cruelty is it to psychologically damage a child because you don't have faith that he wouldn't unravel his dad's sacrifice? What if Red 13 never wanted to become a watcher and had no reason to take this trial? Would you have bothered revealing the truth to him ever? Somehow the rest of the party knew the trial was over and could head through the caverns and be here when Bugenhagen was telling Red 13 to go with him instead of remain here in Cosmo Canyon. When I first heard your friend's emphatic warnings, I dismissed them outright. No more than the ravings of misguided youths. Being able to admit you're wrong is a quality always worth admiring. Bugenhagen stops at apologizing though. I am Nanaki, watcher of Cosmo Canyon and son of Seto, protector of our veil. I'm not dead. I'm just turned to stone. Please help me. There's medicine for this. The pain is so much. My name 
is Guy Natak. Gina Talk, the spirit Red 13 and Barrett just defeated, reappears and bids they follow him to the village of the Gi. This moment was vital for Sephiroth's own plans, but the party came here of their own free will and not because they were hunting Sephiroth. Had they never come here and met Gina Talk, which only happened because Red 13 is with them, then they would have never learned of the Black Materia and begun searching for it. The Cetra are not a tolerant people. Excuse me, am I intolerant too? I'm Cetra. No. But the livestream apparently is, since it's gatekeeping the hell out of the gi. Meanwhile, in a different timeline, Biggs and Zack are discussing the moment when they were about to die and were saved by White Whispers. I can understand different realities branching out from the decisions made by people, but neither Zack's nor Biggs made a choice that would create another timeline. The Whispers were supposed to force the game to play out like the original Final Fantasy. Now we find out they also created divergent timelines because… reasons. Why in the hell did fate pick me? I regret to inform you that if by fate you mean Square Enix, then fate doesn't know why it picked you either, and never figures out how to capitalize on their choice. According to Gina Talk, his people were from another planet that was subsumed by this one. Whatever that entails, it means that even though they now live on this planet, they cannot return to the life stream in death because they were never part of it to begin with. Unable to rest, they got their hands on the purest of materia, and over time, through spite and malicious prayer, created the black materia in the hopes it could end their very existence. This is one of the new story editions that I rather like, since it finally offers an explanation for both the Gi and the black materia, which had none in the original game. The Gi were just a tribe of evil spirits, and the black materia was something the Cetra had for no reason. The Cetra stole the black materia from the Gi, and Gi to talk would like you to retrieve it for them. He doesn't offer you anything in exchange, but seems to expect that you will give him the means of destroying the planet. Also, the long dead Cetra can be forgiven for taking it from them in the first place. Alas, it appears we have been discovered. I have no idea who discovered them, but the party is transported out of the Gi village and back to Cosmo Canyon. Kate Sith just happens to know of a Cetra temple they might be able to find the Black Materia in. But first he needs a Shinra terminal to look up specific information on it. But the one here in Cosmo Canyon was repurposed into a windmill by Bugenhagen. So his suggestion is to head to the nearest one in Nibelheim. Here's the issue. Kate Sith is Reeve, who is inside Shinra's headquarters as we speak. A place where he would have access to the information he needs. So there's no need to send his robot cab body all the way to Nibelheim to use a computer he could use from his own office. He could just look up the information and say something like, I just remembered and save themselves a trip to Nibelheim. Nibelheim. Sephiroth also wants them to head to Nibelheim, since he sends a roadman to Cosmo Canyon to say the name of the place. The weird thing is though, Sephiroth does nothing to them in Nibelheim. He must have figured Kate Say would to choose the terminal there instead of checking the files in his office. Shinra rebuilt an exact replica of Nibelheim and uses it as a treatment center for those with Mako poisoning. This is a bit different from the original game where Shinra rebuilt the village and staffed it with actors in order to cover up the town being destroyed. Building the village back as an exact replica only makes sense if you're planning to cover up its destruction, not turn it into a medical treatment facility. The terminal in town only has limited access, so Kate Sith needs to find the Shinra employee in town with access to the mansion's console, who just happened to head up to the reactor this morning for an inspection. So I guess they've tightened up that area of the business. But once more, Kate Sith is Reeve inside Shinra HQ, where he has all the access he could ever want. None of this is necessary. Not even to keep his identity secret. Cloud memories change again, and he recalls that he did know Zack and that he was here on the Nibelheim mission with him, but substitutes Zack as the Shinra trooper who was washed away by the current. Cloud tells Tifa about this and she practically congratulates him on still being wrong. I retired the ledge paint joke years ago, but this game is going to force me to bring it back. Do you think you used enough, Square Enix? Ninjas from Motai. <sighs> Which means we're at war? You tried to assassinate the president of Shinra and in the DLC broke into Shinra HQ to steal their experimental materia and killed a bunch of Shinra troopers along the way. None of that started a war, but a few Wutai ninjas killed while inspecting this reactor will. They find Murasaki's body right where Tifa found her father five years ago. The universe always seems to bend towards triggering a person's post-traumatic stress disorder. After scanning Murasaki's keycard, Kate Sith leads the rest of the party into Shinra Manor looking for the terminal, only to fall victim to an AI Hojo who drops him into the sub-basement. There has been no shortage of padding in this game, but this section is the most egregious example of it, because it goes on forever while you wallow around as Kate Sith's Moogle flinging boxes at switches. Don't walk into the light, Barrett! Don't worry, the cinder blocks cushioned his fall. No squeezing through those bars. Huh? That duct, however, might just fit a cat. Kate Sith could squeeze through those bars no problem. Also, why would you build such a large and easily accessible air vent into a prison cell? The cell switches are placed so high above the door, even someone of Baron's height would be incapable of reaching them. 
live it again. This robot can get tired. The password is comprised of four two-digit numbers. I wrote them down in this very room, but where? Hojo wrote down the password for the vault two numerals at a time and then moved large containers in front of them. Was he expecting someone to blunder their way in here just so he could mess with them and waste their time before making them fight a monster? Find that terminal? Let's just say we got a little sidetracked. Sidetrack should be the name of this chapter. They stumble into Vincent's goon chamber and find him inside his coffin. Entrances like that have to be practiced. After telling Vincent that their foe is Severoth, he agrees to unlock the door to the other room where the terminal is, but then confronts them when Cloud walks into an adjacent room, telling them he only gave them permission to use the terminal. If you were going to be so strict about letting them into the room but not walk into the other room connected to it, you shouldn't have let them in there to begin with, Mr. Security Guard. This will turn into a key example of the boss when you fight him versus the boss after he joins your party. Vincent Valentine, former Turk. Stumbled on your file in the company database. If they're still buying that Kate Sith is a low-level employee after revealing he just came across info on a former Turk, then they deserve to have the keystone stolen from them. I only ask because you might want to come with us. Kate Sith is way too trusting of Shinra employees considering his own ulterior motives. To even set foot inside the temple, we'll need to get our hands on a relic called the Keystone. Trouble is, it's been missing for nigh on 20 years. So, any guesses as to where it was last seen? The gold saucer. How does Shinra know the exact location of a temple that isn't there? It's simply an altar that will summon a temple once you place a keystone in it. And if Shinra once had the keystone, why did they never use it to create the temple before the keystone disappeared if they think it might be the promised land? And since Shinra has known the party is looking for the temple ever since Cosmo Canyon, why haven't they used the time we've been in Nibelheim to secure the keystone? Since it was from their own company vials, we learned that its last known location was the gold saucer. Rose shows up, hopped up on Red Bull and Genova cells for another fight before finally succumbing to the degradation all soldiers suffer from. This sort of explains where the robe men get their matching robes from. They just appear on them out of nowhere once they succumb to degradation. That's a whole lot of Middle Eastern terrorist recording imagery for a nation based on Japan. And to lead us, Wutai's commander, Viceroy Saru. Glenn hacks the feed to spread propaganda on the Wutai and ninjas who were killed at the Nibelheim reactor, before introducing Viceroy Saruf, who is a no-show, which shouldn't inspire much confidence in the anti-Shinra forces of the guy who is supposed to lead them, won't even show up for the declaration of war. This is the dev's way of creating mystery around Viceroy Saruf, but only end up making his operations seem dumb. Just how is Reeve controlling Kate Sith as he sits in his boardroom meeting and displays video directly from his point of view of the party? The Ancient is en route to the temple as we speak. Pursuing her is our top priority. You already know where the temple is located though. You can go there right now since you believe it to be the promised land, a place full of Mako. You don't actually need the temple since Mako is pulled out of the ground. Kate Sith is checked out during the meeting, which means Reeve can't do two things at once, which means he's somehow spending all of his time controlling Kate Sith while being very clever about hiding his sleep mode, except for this one time. So, how exactly are we supposed to get back to the saucer? The party had no idea how to get back to the gold saucer, even though they've flown in Sid's plane twice now. It took Sid lighting a fire at the airstrip to remind them they have an option. Sid and Vincent technically join up with the party, but because Square Enix needs to have new player characters for the third game, they won't be joining in any fights. Just standing around outside where the party does the dangerous stuff. Sid, at the very least, serves as your fast travel to anywhere on the map. The most consequential thing Vincent does for the party is save Clown's life during a card game. Try to screw us over, and you're a dead man. If Vincent wants full immunity for screwing them over, he'll need to be a cat, as you'll soon see. Both engines on the tiny Bronco burn out in flight. Was this thing built by Boeing? Sid manages to convert the Bronco into a boat in an afternoon, somehow. Then takes it all the way to Costa del Sol, where he should probably repair it back to being a plane, but leaves it as is to use as a boat later. My ancestors owned it. Don't you think that makes me its rightful owner? Modern problems require modern arguments. Aerith apparently learned this one from the Gi. Dio has a wager with Don Corneo in the upcoming Musclehead Coliseum battle. If Corneo wins, he gets to rename the Gold Saucer to Corneo Land. If Dio wins, he… well, it doesn't seem like Dio gets anything out of this wager, so I'm unsure why he agreed to it. But he's too beat up from his fight with Rude and asks Clown and the party to stand in for him. In return, he'll give them the Keystone. I had no idea you were in a song right in. Oh, I'm not. But I wanted to give it a shot. Aerith decided to become a songwriter on a whim tonight. Here. Cloud's all yours. I'll take care of Aerith after. 
I don't think the devs understand the fan base that well. I'm pretty certain Zack giving Cloud a sponge bath is seen by most as the main event, and going on a date with someone in the party is the warm up, not the other way around. When she wakes up, a scary man is gonna kill her. Huh? Cloud tries to save her, but he doesn't make it in time. Of all the future information Aerith could have shared with Marlene to calm her down back when the Sector 7 plate was dropping, she chose to share her own death. Actually, there's this play I want to see, and would you mind coming with? They always say the worst someone can say is no. I reloaded and finished an hour-long side quest to become the Chocobo Racing Champion, all to impress Tifa enough to get her to ask me out so I wouldn't have to date Red 13 who is both a dog and a miner. If I bought tickets to a live event and had to put on VR glasses to watch an all-digital show, I'm going to demand a refund. The event asked for a make em bloom to come to the front desk. I take it this is Aerith's pin name. Turns out they wanted to perform the song she wrote. Did I miss something? Did Aerith enter a songwriting contest? How did they know she'd even written a song? Must be really odd for anyone who watches the news, because the Gold Saucer play of Loveless features a holographic Jesse, someone who quit acting to become a terrorist and died in Sector 7, where she along with the rest of Avalanche were blamed for the deaths of thousands. I'm surprised you guys aren't more upset by a company profiting off the likeness of your dead friend. The next act of the play is immersive theater, with the audience playing roles. Somehow the VR system knew to pair Cloud up with his friends in this scene despite all the other people in the audience also taking part. Aerith singing her song is still a digital VR performance, so why are Cloud and the others standing around like they're backstage in their outfits, while everyone else is watching from their seats? Again, this is in VR. Why would Wedge, Biggs, and Jesse appear in the traditional ghost seats in a theater? Biggs isn't even dead. There's no way these were programmed into the event. Our conclusions are based on a long-standing theory. It's safe to assume the temple and the promised land are one and the same. Shinra has zero interest in the Black Materia. This is the same company that is planning to go to war over the Magnus Materia. But a potential weapon of mass destruction is beneath their notice. I understand the Keystone is to be awarded to the winners of today's special event. How should we proceed? I have an idea. Does it involve using the spy you place in their ranks? I bet it involves the spy you place in their ranks. Now that we're doing this, isn't it incredibly messed up that this family-friendly theme park has a blood sports arena where a sex pest and human trafficker is allowed to fight for naming rights? We cutting them off? Or should we rip them off? That or smash them maybe? Let's fill them with lead. Don't bother. I'll just bite them off. I wonder what Vincent would threaten to do to Corneo's balls. On second thought, best not to think about that. A grudge match then! Over which I must insist you allow me to officiate. There's a robbery taking place as we speak, and you bring out benches and vending machines so they can rest up and fight for entertainment after they just save your theme park from being taken over by a sexual predator. After beating the Turks, Ruva Shinra pops out of the floor to challenge Cloud to a one-on-one. -on -one. I hope Dio charged a lot for these tickets, because they have the ruler of the world here fighting a wanted terrorist. You're still a Shinra employee. At least on paper. And as your boss, I figured I'd dispose of you personally. If I knew that the person in charge of navigating a war that was just declared was off fighting in a tournament about who controls a local business, I'd be packing my bags. Does losing a blood sport match hurt your polling numbers much? Or stock price in this case, I suppose? Despite all the time the Turks and Rufus bought him, Kate Sith is still running around the gold saucer floor area with the keystone. Barrett, would you like to shoot at the helicopter maybe? Any of you want to do something besides stand there as Kate Sith hands over the keystone to Sung? Barrett, no! Please! Screw it. Piece of shit ain't worth the bullets anyway. He really isn't, because Kate Sith is simply a robot avatar with multiple bodies. I don't understand. Why? Because he's an asshole! One we should have never trusted in the first place! Says the Materia Thief who betrays the party in the original game, and likely will in the future. Not you too. This is why you check your spies for weak emotions, or don't send random directors of urban development instead of trained operatives. I knew from the start that I had to end this way. But it still stings. Kate Sith could have just told him he found no information on the whereabouts of the Keystone and allowed Shinra to take control of it rather than win it at the Gold Saucer to hand over to them. He never even had to bring up the Keystone in the first place and could have allowed it to be a dead end in the party's search. The only one who knows where the temple is is Kate Sith. But he told the Turks, whose chopper I should be able to track. Really? I know which radio frequencies they use. The moment they get on comms, I'll find them. But they would know that a former Turk is with them, so would likely be using different frequencies or encryption to avoid detection. And it's been decades since you were a Turk. Technology changes, but Shinra idiots and do exactly as he says they will. 
I hope you realize this temple of yours is not, in fact, the promised land. Shinra's obsession with the promised land is borderline irrational. They have no idea what it is or even if it exists. All they have is a single mention in the legends of the Citra about it. This world conquering company is akin to a group of crazies who think they know where the Garden of Eden is located due to some obscure translation in the Old Testament. Placing the keystone causes the temple to construct itself out of thin air. Though for some reason there are broken pieces even though it's freshly made. This shouldn't be like your traditional ruin that has been worn away. I know I came with you all this far. I ain't about to go in there. Our future party members for the next game, waiting bravely outside. The Cetra didn't design their temple to be very wheelchair friendly, did they? That black materia's gotta be worth a fortune! Shh! Oh, not another word about the black materia. We can't let Shinra find out. Like Kate hasn't already told them. The odd thing is, I think they don't know about the black materia, because they never mention it even once. Aerith is ripping off Yuna's dance. There are now far too many connections to Final Fantasy X, and I am officially worried about the rumor of them being the same world is getting closer to the truth. Cloud's behavior should honestly have Tifa more concerned, considering what happened the last time he was acting like this. Walk into the room, detonate the explosive right behind you, then leave because you somehow predicted the explosion would leave you just enough time before the rebel blocked the entrance completely. The live stream wants to teach Aerith how to be at one with it, which gives her an all too long sequence where you run around twirling the thumbstick to reveal ancient structures. It's not death. It's a homecoming. Stop. Please. Just because the Turk soundtrack slaps doesn't mean you shouldn't kill them. Vincent is following behind the team. Why is he in the temple if I can't blaze him? Sung made it to the inner trial chamber with one of the robed men who turns into a Sephiroth and stabs him. Which Sung just walks away from because Sephiroth's aim was off I guess. Where do I get guns like that? Sung just one shot Sephiroth and I'm going to have to beat him with a sharp metal sword for 30 minutes in a few hours. This pedestal's a key. One only an ancient can use. Sung went from being stunned that the temple was actually a fortress to knowing its architectural secrets. The trial chamber has each of them, other than Cloud, face their saddest memory, all of which we already know of, and with the exception of Red 13, have seen directly. Aerith losing her mother, Barrett losing his wife and Karel, the death of Tifa's father, and Yuffie having to face a character from the terrible Dirge of Cerberus game. These moments have already had their impact, so having them reaffirmed for no reason as some kind of lesson on moving past trauma doesn't convince me that they've all grown stronger. This just seems like it would trigger post-traumatic stress. How did Afona keep Hojo from discovering the white materia she kept on her the entire time she was their prisoner? It's not safe here. If Ana may have asked Elmira to take Aerith somewhere safe, but she didn't imply that Aerith was in immediate danger. But somehow Elmira knew to hurry Aerith away from the train station right before Shinra troopers arrived. The temple didn't force Cloud to undergo his own sadness trial, probably because that would have given away that his history is a lie. Instead, Sephiroth messes with him with an ASMR monologue about how emotionless Cloud was during the tragedy of Sector 7. Oh, Cloud. You're such a disconnected actor. I'll never be like him. We know. It's okay. At this point, Tifa is abetting Cloud's mental issues by refusing to call him out and just telling him that it's okay every time Cloud starts to lose it. This not only isn't okay, it's not helping him any. The ancients recorded their history here, telling of their downfall at the hands of man and their victory over the calamity from the stars, which they somehow knew would be named Genova millennia after their own extinction. Because Professor Gas was the one who named it Genova after discovering its remains, not the Cetra. The Cetra brought the black materia here to ensure no one would ever be able to use it. Why not just destroy it? Materia is not indestructible. It's just crystallized Mako. In the original game, Shinra uses huge materia as the core of a rocket they shoot a meteor to try and destroy it. And in Remake, we witness manufactured materia explode in Shinra HQ. And in this game, Sephiroth stab right through a mass of materia housed inside a weapon. I, son of Genova, will at last claim my birthright. My dominion shall reach into infinity. It shall encompass worlds unbound by fate, and histories unwritten. I'd argue that Sephiroth's goal and his reasoning don't match up. Becoming a god is an out of left field objective for a man who discovered that he was the creation of an alien mutagenic monster. Normally you'd think revenge or remaking the world that humans have destroyed was on the table. But he wants to completely destroy the world, absorb the life stream, and become a god. But now he also wants to merge separate realities so he can become the god over infinity. What does doing this correct from his point of view? For what purpose? And that's the problem. Sephiroth has no point of view besides doing something evil because he was cast as the villain. There's no such thing as forever. Ah. 
but there will be. Ultimecia is going to want to have a word with Sephiroth for ripping off her plan. Kate Sith couldn't have possibly known that removing the black materia from the altar would cause the temple to come down, but still made his way here in a rush as it's happening. Running through the entire temple that took the party hours to get through, all the way to the altar room where he scans it, then jumps under the plate to hold it up. Having learned from a scan of an ancient relic that he can buy them time to escape by keeping it from sinking into the floor. Besides, there's no point fighting over a fake. Aerith says this black materia is a fake. The game won't really address this point, but why collapse the temple on the thief if it's a fake? I wish I had Judging by that joke, you shouldn't have skipped creative writing day either. I have secured us an exit. No, they secured the exit by fighting everything on the way here. You just followed in their footsteps. Why act like this is self-sacrifice? Kate Sith is a robot and Reeve is safe back in Midgar. He already has another avatar waiting outside, since he apparently predicted that his current one would be destroyed inside the temple. This is the key, which grants access to the true counterpart hidden between worlds. I thought it just summoned Meteor, but okay. I suppose it's only fair since the white materia was upgraded to give you knowledge of the future. However, this game presented the idea that materia can be drained of its power by whispers. And there are the white whispers that are opposed to Sephiroth. Why not just have them drain the black materia? Give it back! Aerith should never be on Antique Rojo, since she claimed the materia was a fake, but is now desperate to get it back from Sephiroth. That black tendril is the game's excuse for why the rest of the party can't reach Cloud and Aerith, or even see what happens. Aerith and Tifa wait until Cloud has trudged all the way across the tendril to Sephiroth before trying to stop him. This is the point where the game becomes more incomprehensible than blockchain technology. This scene epitomizes my initial fears when the multiverse concept was introduced at the end of Remake. It's an overindulgence in alternate realities and characters that could easily leave any player bewildered. The storyline is now so thick with alternate dimensions and extra chromosomes that it risks not just confusing its audience, but losing them in a web of narrative excess that seems more interested in showcasing its complexity than in maintaining coherence and emotional impact. The irony here is that this game will basically handhold its smooth brain players through basic navigation by slapping yellow paint on anything worth noticing yet simultaneously expects them to untangle a Gordian knot of plot threads, multiple timelines, alternate characters, cryptic non-answers, and an increasingly unreliable narrative all on their own. Sephiroth sends Cloud on a multiverse journey by knocking him and Aerith into a hole in the ground after Cloud hands over the black materia to him. He wakes up in Aerith's house back in Midgar, with Marlene and Elmira curiously nowhere to be found. In this universe, Aerith knows what's going on since she still has a complete white materia and so leads Cloud on a date through the slums to the church where she gives him her full white materia to give to Aerith in his universe, since this world is doomed to die, before pushing Cloud into the flower bed which sends him back to his own world right before Sephiroth arrives a killer a little too late. Zack has to decide between going to see Hojo to find a cure for Cloud, or stopping Biggs from blowing himself up in a reactor. But thanks to the multiverse, we get to see him do both. Reminiscent of his death, the Zack that went to Shinra Tower to find Hojo faces off against a platoon of Shinra troopers so it seems like there are canon events that happen no matter what. Meanwhile, the Zack that went after Biggs finds him in Reactor 6 that he hasn't bothered to bomb because the planet is already out of Mako. Then he's shot dead by Shinra troopers. So whatever reason the White Whispers saved him for is lost on me. Based upon the stamp doll Johnny walks by with, which are used as totems by the developers to delineate universes from each other, the Zack we've been following since the start of the game didn't choose either path and went to Aerith's church instead. Then Sephiroth appears, headed into the church to presumably kill Aerith, who would have just entered with Cloud but somehow never ran into Zack sitting on the steps outside it. Or was that in a different universe and the church is simply a portal to it? He stops just long enough to split the timeline open so Zack can fall into the void, where he's led by yellow flower petals to a different timeline. If they insist on being this confusing, I'm going to demand a lot more yellow petals, which I think of as the yellow paint of the multiverse, to establish a clear and followable path through this nonsense. Remember when this was a simple and easy to understand story about environmentalism and corporate greed? Well, Sephiroth is here to give Cloud an ASMR explanation on the multiverse, that the planet encompasses many worlds, but all of them are quick to die and then return to the planet since all these possibilities exist within the life stream. It must have taken Sephiroth an incredibly long time to learn all this, since he missed all of it the first time around. Back then, he just wanted to smash Meteor into the planet and suck up all the life stream. Now he wants to merge separate timelines and battle entropy and who knows what else. Behold, the true nature of reality. If you say so, it resembles a PlayStation 2 startup menu to me. The planet encompasses a multitude of worlds, ever unfolding. The possibilities are endless, Cloud. There could be a universe where I convince you to eat instant noodles while I dress up as a fox. That doesn't belong here. Very poor form. I think Sephiroth just called Aerith and Cloud dirty, cheating glitch gamers for their item duplication. 
Next, Cloud finds himself in the sleeping forest with Aerith again, who has decided to stop Sephiroth on her own by praying for Holy, even though she doesn't have the white material to do so anymore, and couldn't have foreseen that Cloud would arrive out of nowhere to give it to her. When talking to someone whose mind is stew, don't use teleportation to be a dick and mess with his head even more, and make him wonder if this was a dream or not. After Sephiroth got his hands on the black materia, Aerith just knew that the Cetra had a city nearby, even though earlier she had no idea where the temple was located until they learned the facts from Shinra. Instead of heading there with the party, she tells them about it, starts the journey towards it, then ditches them inside the sleeping forest, even though she would have to know they would come looking for her since she already told them where she was going and where to find it. She said Sephiroth kicked the ever-living crap out of you back in the Temple of the Ancients. You heard wrong. Didn't go down like that. Okay. Then how exactly did he get the materia from you? Aerith covered for Cloud by telling the rest of them that Sephiroth beat him up and took the black materia. I guess Tifa's on board with this lie, because she knows that isn't the case. The Grand Metropolis, where the Ancients once gathered to pray, thought lost to time. Unlike the Temple of the Ancients, how did everyone miss the location of a massive Cetra city? This area of the world isn't uninhabited. Canonically, there's a ski resort nearby. I'm waiting, Cloud. How many times did they record this line? Sephiroth has spent a good chunk of the game sounding like he's impatiently waiting on his DoorDash delivery. Send him a photo of the black materia on his doorstep already. Reusing that animation from Remake, are you? It's upon us. The reunion. When worlds merge. When spite and sorrow are harvested. To feed the planet. Sephiroth, what the hell are we even talking about? Every other location in the game, including the optional Gongaga region, was expanded upon to an overly long degree. But here in the Forgotten Capital, they skip past all of that so you can reach the prayer chamber where Aerith awaits. All of this multiverse nonsense is the fault of this scene. Because Aerith's death is such an important event in gaming history, they had to make the entire game ten times more confusing just to give themselves a way to go in a different direction. A multiverse allows you to have your cake and kill it too, which is what they've done here. As far as I can tell, Cloud both saves Aerith and he doesn't, turning Aerith into a Schrodinger's cat, both alive and dead, depending on the viewer. They couldn't just have Cloud save Aerith properly, since that would deny the rest of the game the narrative weight her sacrifice earned, and would require extensive rewriting to account for her presence for the second half of the game. And they couldn't justify remaking the game over the course of a decade without at least giving you a different conclusion. Sephiroth doesn't have a reason for a big final boss fight other than this is the end of the game. He already did what he came to do, kill Aerith and harvest sadness. But then he sends another Genova monster for the team to fight, and after it's over, Zack is running through the white void and finds an image of Cloud, and upon touching it the two of them are reunited so they can deliver pure fan service as they fight Sephiroth together. Then Sephiroth separates them and sends Zack to a different world and turns into Bizarro Sephiroth. Or Sephiroth Reborn now, I guess. As Cloud, Zack, and the rest of the party all battle him across different universes. I need to develop a new form of math just to plot this bullshit. After all that, you face Sephiroth one final time alongside Aerith. Which Aerith? Don't ask me, because there's no way of knowing for sure. Rhetorical questions meant to point out flaws are worthless when the answers can't even be speculated on. Why is he laughing? Because he knows this isn't over. Sephiroth pieces out because all that fighting accomplished nothing. Were you worried that Square Enix would save Aerith? Were you worried that he'd kill Aerith again? How about being concerned that they'd choose to make the scene incomprehensible? Or did you think they wouldn't commit to anything and kick the can that answers the question to the last game? Square Enix heard all those concerns and responded to all of them with yes. From the way this is depicted, Cloud is the only one who can see Aerith, and he's the only one acting like she didn't just die. No one can conclusively tell where Square Enix will take this, whether all this is a product of Cloud's messed up head, some live stream projection of Aerith's soul, or an alternate reality that exists simultaneously. So disregard anyone claiming they have the answers, because this was put together in such a way as to give the writers maximum leverage for whichever direction they want to go in the final game. I'm on to you. This war is nothing but a ploy to distract me from Sephiroth. You really kept that little tidbit close to the chest by falling for the plot hook, line, and sinker. It's a bold move to lure your enemy into a false sense of security by doing exactly what they want you to do. Why kill Rufus's father then if he was already going to go to war with Wutai? He had already started on that project, and you had to remind Rufus about his obligations. Yes, shoot the mobile game character. It's what you should have done the moment he showed up. Sid has somehow fixed the tiny Bronco with no parts. Even made new wings appear out of thin air. <sighs> Aerith? Red 13 seems to sense Aerith, but Cloud is the only one who really knows what's going on. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why he doesn't at least try to explain things to everyone. He mentions the rift in the sky, which only he sees, so why never mention Aerith? He has to know they all think Aerith is dead. Cloud finds the black materia on him and puts it inside his sword. He has just stopped questioning everything. I can't blame him. 
None of this makes any sense. The tiny Bronco can take off vertically? Sid needed a runway for takeoff before. These remakes have all featured subtitles that begin with a syllable re. I suggest calling the third game rhetorical to really get across how nothing is meant to be answered.